Thank you, Keith. Okay, that's it. Uh, we have a guest hire tonight, uh, an innovative guest hire who, whose flies show up in the Feathercraft catalog and they show up in the Rainy catalog. And I don't know where else they can maybe share that with us, but this, uh, Craig brought this a couple weeks ago to a meeting we were here one night doing something. And I managed to uh, convince him to come and share it with us. And he was gracious of enough to, uh, to agree. So uh, you want, did, the, the, the floor is yours, sir. So however you want to go. Right there. Thank you. We on that one I don't right even there. know what it's called. So tell us what that is. Um, all right. Uh... I'll just start with, I'm correct. <laughs> to everybody out there, hey. For those who don't know me, I'm Craig Riendo. Um, qualifications, I am the founding member of the ISA Bass Buggers. I started all that baloney for anybody who's part of that. Uh, I do, I design flies for Rainy's Flies. Uh, I have about, I don't know what, about 10 patterns now that are in their catalog that are sold worldwide. And I'm getting filthy rich on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and other, but other than that, I've also been a drift member for near forever. In fact, I think when I joined drift, it was the last century. It's, it's been a while. And when I joined, the man who used to stand up here and talk was uh, Doc Art Major. He was our president back then, rest in peace. He's a great guy, and he used to always say, after he'd talk his meal, and before we start tying the thing, he'd always say that sticks in my head, and he says, remember, let's have fun. That's what this is about. It's about having fun. If you're not having fun here, you're in the wrong place. It's, the object here is to learn, but it should be fun. Yeah, yeah, things got to be a little challenging, a little different. Uh, anybody who's been here at any of my other ties know I stretched the limit of fun, challenging to the limits. You could say, um, I take it to a different dimension. So with that said, uh, welcome to the twilight zone of fly time. First thing before we tie, I wanna show you what we're tying and what makes it so darn special. Uh, it's hard for me to see back there, but what we're tying today, I call them the rubber bugger. It's basically, because uh, I don't know what you see, basically, a uh, woolly bugger. Only, it, there seems to be like there's only two types of flies in the world. One's that everything's furled, you know, palmered around or it's strung down the back. So you've got a woolly bugger or a clouds of minnow. Everything is a knockoff of one or the other. But this one, what makes it different, I say I'm a warm water fisherman. I'm not that it doesn't catch trout or it doesn't catch saltwater fish. I designed it originally for bass. You know, it catches large mouths, small mouths, you know, shoal bass, spotted bass, white bass. Yeah, if it's got bass in its name, it'll eat it. Pike eat it, walleye eat it. I've caught just about everything. I've fished the Wisconsin River a lot. I catch everything out there on it. I fish up in Mille Lacs. I catch things on it. I was just catching things in Florida on it. So it works everywhere. But then again, a, bully bug, a bugger works anywhere. But what makes this one different is, first off, is the back end. The legs are, see, is, we're not talking feathers here. We're talking stretchy rubber legs which do two purposes. One, they're a soft, squishy thing. So if a fish comes up and nips it at the back end, they feel something that feels alive. I fish with enough gear guys. Most of my fishing partners are gear guys and you cannot beat plastics. I am sorry, I don't care who you are. If there's not a hatch going on, you're not gonna beat plastics. And so I says, well, you can't beat them, enjoy them. Maybe it's sacrilege, but I don't care. It works and I am enjoying it and the fishing to love it. But second thing about the rubber legs back here, they float. The thing is the back end, this fly, if you can swim it along like a streamer, but when you stop and you let it go to the bottom, head goes down, the weight goes to the bottom, the back end, it stands dead up. So typically if you threw a woolly bugger out there, it, you let it sink to the bottom, it hits the bottom, it rolls over on its side. Next thing you know, the hook is in the muck, the weeds, the sticks, the logs, or whatever. You try to pick it off the bottom, well, that's where it's staying. This sucker, A, the hook never touches the bottom because it stands up. And B, I don't know how I can see this, got a double weed guard. Matter of fact, I call this a full roll cage because now as you come off the back of the hook, 
but even comes around to the front of the hook, that it's even protecting the knot. Says so this thing, when it stands up like this, it can slide or roll. There's nothing to catch. The eye, the knot isn't where it can be caught. This whole, everything is round, so it just slides off any cover. Thing is almost impossible to hang up. So like I said, you can swim it along, drop it on a bomb, crawl it like a plastic worm, hop it like a jig, um, strip it along like a streamer. There is no wrong way to fish it. <clears throat> uh, if somebody wants to pass one of these boxes around, it they want to see what we're tying. And uh, but I don't know, can we switch? Can I show you one of the tanks? Is that possible to get a camera on this? Uh, go, go, should I just move the tank in front of the camera or the camera in front no, of the tank? No, no, no. Oh, you're going to zoom me out. Well, I'll just, yeah, let's just point it over to that one and zoom. I can play over here. There you go. You see it? Yeah. There we go. Get back up a little bit with the camera. Yeah. yeah you can see the tank. There you go. There you go. Like you said, you got the fly, maybe get wet. But when it goes to the bottom, you'll see it's going to just stand. How I move it, it's going to fall, it's going to stand right up. Mm -hmm. Well, it's basically uh, right. is this is, is Craig, yes. Move, move to the side or sit down. Uh, Actually, you can point. Are you sure? Yeah. Oh, my shadow. Down. There we go. <laughs> I won't cast. No, we'll move the camera. Yeah. Yeah. Scoot closer, Bob, and then just point it down on the other side. I always cause problems everywhere I go. That works. You see, I'd say if you want to play, you know, jig or plastic worm or something for bass crawling on the bottom, well, here you go. So this, I said, this, as you were asking, it says I can throw it on a four. It's light enough you can throw on a four. I typically fish sevens and eights, um, just because I, I fish it on stiffer tippets. I usually fish a twelve to fifteen pound tippet because I'm fishing bass in cover. I don't want anything real light, but if you go to smallmouth lake, which is rock bottom, you, know, you go six, six or eight pound test, and you can fish in any weight rod you feel like, whatever you can cast in the wind or anything. Better for smallmouth than largemouth. No, no? equally, equally. equally. It, it, it does. Matter of fact, I said, I, in Florida, I was getting largemouth. I was on Rich Miguel against ponds. I caught a couple of largemouths there. Uh, I said, Mill Lax, I was not only catching smallmouth, I was catching walleyes. And when I was throwing the chartreuse one, I was getting northern pike all over the place. Uh, does that, but to show you that it can swim well too. Let's put the swimming pool back in. And second. Man in his toys. Oops. Put this back. I'm going to two. You see the sucker. It's very enticing when it's swimming. Swimming in the way. And it's got tons of motion, wiggles. Just it doesn't roll up on you either. No, no, because the waist weight, yeah, okay. And but the thing is it's in the round. It's tied in the round. So it doesn't, even if it did roll over, it's never upside down. Because the top, the bottom, the side, everything looks the same. And like I said, it just, it's a killer. I'll leave that right and we can come back over. Okay. Yes. Uh, where do you get the rubber bodies from? I mean, you know, so we go in, so we should, Yeah, all, all these things. All, but, uh, they're all uh, multiple places. Uh, places like Walgreens, Walmarts, Targets, uh, CBS. I go online, they're all over the place. If you go out, if you you check out googly balls, <laughs> all things to look for. Or, or if you look, um, another place I'm online is autistic kids sensory toys. Okay. You look under that that, that that's uh, something they're all over. It's that I, they've been squishy and stretchy. I guess it does something, but yeah, they're all over that. Yeah, hopefully I, I'm working trying to get my website back up, and when I get it going, I'll be a distributor of them. <laughs> it, 
Because I buy them in bulk. I don't buy one or two. I, I buy them yeah. dozens at a time. So. The bigger ones are harder to find. The bigger ones are harder to find. Yeah, yeah. they are. It, it's they used yeah. used to be easier. Uh, past no. since pandemic, they've gotten hard to find. Uh, I have a Chinese company source. You know the maker, and and I buy them. You know a box at a time. I don't buy one, two. I buy a lot. I, I've got a, several hundred at home. <laughs> World supply is me. Is that? Yep. I think. Once there we go. There we go. Yeah. All right. Uh, which one are we on? You been? That one I want to show you some of the materials we're going to use on this thing. So we put them in front of the thing. Well, it's big. You may want to back out. Let's see. All right. The materials, like I said, I gave Mark a list of materials of what we're using, but there's a couple of things I forgot about. Uh, again, as I said, we do things a little different in my world of fly time. So there's a couple things I brought enough for everybody, so don't worry about it. Some of the things we typically need to help make the body, do I need a can of great stuff? To help make the body, to help smooth out the body, you're going to need lacrosin to just smooth out the great stuff. To help get rid of the rough edges, everybody's going to got yourself a torch. <laughs> got a torch. <laughs> and then just in case everything goes sideways, ah. we carry one of these. So we're, 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 we got ourselves covered. It, it is. It's great stuff. It's actually, you know, all the dang stuff. We, but... In reality, we don't need this. I'm joking. <laughs> and we probably don't need this one either. And well, maybe we'll just put this somewhere close. We we'll just keep that nearby. But otherwise than that, we got this stuff and this stuff. Everybody knows you got to have this stuff. What's life without googly balls? You got to have googly balls. I do have tips for everybody. When we get to it, I don't know if you want me to tie one first. Yeah. To get yeah. so you get an idea because it's again, there are things in here you've probably never done. And as Doc says, let's have fun. And if you do the same thing you used to doing all the time, what are you learning? You just, yeah, I know how to do that. Look, I did it again. Well, today you're not going to do it again. You're going to do it for the first time. So today's going to be a whole lot of fun. Start with the hook. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows Do It Mold Company. You probably get these through other people, but I get Do It Molds. It's a jig company. You go do it, uh, mold, M O L D dot com online. They got a great catalog. Every type of hook in the world you could ask for, they got. But this is a must-add 32833 BLN number two. BLN black nickel number two. It's a jig, it's a 90 degree jig hook. If you see that there. I'm gonna use one of those. Uh, what color do I feel like tying? I'll tie one of the other ones. Then you need a brass cone head, a uh, size large. This is the weight in the fly. Uh, again, what color depends, you know, I use black with the darker flies. I use gold with the lighter, but you can, you know, whatever makes you happy. There is no set pattern because somebody says I make two tones or three tones. Easy enough. Uh, I don't know. Okay, I got to do everything up above here, okay? I can't see back. Can you see my hand? Mm -hmm. Got the hook. Thread the weight on there. Yep, yeah, it sticks to the palm of your hand. You get that on. I know how we're going to secure that weight on there. We're not. Try that one on. Just put it there, leave it there. 
get your thread. I say, use any thread you want. I use, I don't know if you can see that, 6,000 mono thread. This is, I tie just about everything worth it for the combination A, B, and left-handed, and I don't unwind the thread with each wrap. Uh, and also the fact that it matches any color of anything I do. And plus when I'm tying on weed guards and if I wrap down the shank of the hook, it basically becomes invisible. But does it matter? No. I've, you tie it with black thread and wrap it down, well, the hook's black. So if you got black thread, it won't show up. If you got dark green thread, it really won't show up. Fish don't care. Only we do. We make pretty flies for fishermen. We make typically ugly flies catch fish. But you got that on. And the next thing you need is let's put the weed guard on. And on this one, hard mason mono, 16 pound test. Hard mason, if I can get to find the end here. Here's a little trick, as you can see it. That's showing up there, you see how coily it is? Well, this will be slightly off the screen, but I'll show you how this is done. I put the spool there, I hold it between my knees to hold it in place, and I grab the end of the model with the four sips pliers or something. I just grab it and I pull it taut and just take my fingers and run them up and down real quick. And you'll feel this model heat up to the point that you can't even hold it anymore. And hold it taut for a few seconds. Just pull it taut. I say maybe close to 10 seconds. When I'm done, my model is straight. Took the curls right out of it. So again, I you can see a nice piece there. What you need is two pieces, uh, five inch, five to six inches long. Five inch will do if you want to not use up material, six inches if you need something to hang on to. So I got two pieces. These are going to be the weed guards. We're going to tie them along the shank of the hook, one on the left side, one on the right. It's not on the top. It's going to be along the side of the shank. And we're going to start it uh, about a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch behind where the bead head is going to sit. So it's kind of right about where my thread is sitting right now. Catch it. Wrap it along, this, again, this at the side of the shank. Go down, come back. So you can see, you know, it's along the side of the shank. I'll take the sister piece, put it on the other side, starting the same place. Make sure you got it on the side of the hook. And down, back, just make sure it stays. So as you can see, I got, I turn sideways, you can see we got one on this side, one on that side. Now we're gonna wrap this, I said, down about halfway around the bend of the hook. I'm on my vice, I don't know if your vices are the same, but I'm gonna stop my threads where literally the hook touches the vise. That's about halfway around. I know on certain vices, it probably won't be the same, but it's about halfway. I'm just gonna wrap it down to shank, trying to stay along the side of the hook. And this is pretty quick, because basically, I don't know if anybody's tied weed guys before, because really what I'm doing, how close can you see that? Is what I'm doing is, you know, if I just wrap around, you know, you know, don't have to be right up where the other wrap is, but way down here, wrap around, and when you pull, that wrap will slide right back up tight to the other one. You know, so you come down, it pulls up, tie it down, it pulls up. So that way you can just zing real fast. So I say I get these two where I want them to be. Let's go down, 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 down. This is I want about just touch the vise on my right about there. When I get to the bottom, I'm gonna back up and go right over to the last wraps I made. So I have a double coating of the thread over it. So you can see where the weed guards are. And to make that more durable, some good old hard as nails. Just basically put that on that thread and glues it 
condor. I'll put a, as I say, typically the, you know, bass don't have teeth, but they got like sandpaper jaws that after a few fish, if you don't coat it with things, they'll, they'll break through that model and the weed never fall apart. So that's actually an important step. And you turn the back right side up and you find your hard mason again. And now you just get a little piece about three inches long. No, I said three inch piece. And now this is gonna be tied on top of the shank. I don't know because you got the two monos side by side on either side. You're actually gonna be tying this on top of those, that those are gonna be like the rafts that this is gonna sit on. And again, start at about the same point in the front. This one back and come back forward. And there's another piece of something you gotta make here. This is where I said where it's gonna be. Oh, I've never done that before. And said, no. What we're gonna do? Uh, if I got one of these flies over here. Yeah. You can see on the rubber legs here what they are attached to. If I can pull the hair out of the way. Uh, you can see the black things it's attached to. What those are, are two pieces of rainy float foam, size medium. It's A, gives a, a, something to attach the legs to, and B, it adds more float. That's what helps makes this thing stand on its nose when it sinks. So I take the foam. Again, whatever color suits your fancy, you know, you, you can match, I make a dark fly, I make black. Am I on camera here? I want to cut about a 3 16th, not an eighth, not a quarter, 3 16th. And if anybody, if you can make it bigger, but it, too little, it won't help enough. Too much is overkill and to fly. So I found it's just the medium. If anybody ever tied with my rubber ringers, things, 3 16th is the exact same size. So that's probably why I did it, but anyway. Yeah, I got a measure here if I wanted to, and I say, oh yeah, there's, you know, there's exactly three sixteenths. You can see it's going to cut one, the other one, two. So you got two of these pieces here at three sixteenths of an inch. Secure it to the side. And then what we have to do, put this back here. I have to get a hole through the middle of this thing. You can, I say, simply just take your bodkin, point it at the middle, you know, twist it through, and kind of twist it around to kind of enlarge it so you know where it is. Or, or you take your torch. <laughs> what are these for? That's why I love to I, I normally just use a lighter that I found out, you know, this is the microwave oven compared to this. It's, it takes 10 seconds to warm up, I, to heat this thing up on that. With this sucker, it's glowing red already. Just take it, yep. You poke it through the middle, and you got a beautiful hole through the middle. But like I said, you can just take the bodkin and take the bodkin and poke it through the middle. May I just find this just makes a cleaner, bigger hole. It's easier, easier to find because I could see it. When I just poke the bodkin through, it kind of closes up, but it's still there. If you poke the mono at it, you'll find it. Okay, now you got the two holes in that sucker. Either you can do two things here. One, if you have a little bitty like jeweler size uh, needle nose, or you can simply use your scissors if you don't have this. Let's assume I go long. You guys don't have one. I take scissors. Of course, you have to drop a black thing on the black floor. Yeah, that works well. Show you how to do that again. <laughs> I do this at home too. Drop things and everything rolls under my desk and I never find it again. But sure, yeah, everybody needs a torch. It's one, two, three, and it's glowing red that fast. 
back through there. Okay, we got that. I say normally I used the the jeweler's pliers, but if I say I'm just because I'm assuming nobody has them, we're going to do the other way. Put one on either end, and you want to put them on here so they sort of align with each other. Because what we're going to do, take our super glue, go to one side, little dab will do you like grill cream, close them together, and I'll hold it. Right about there, there you go. Two little pieces here now glued together. And what you do with that, you come to the back of the fly, you find out which end you like better. The other one's glued together. If you got it, one end that's flatter than the other, it's kind of. I hold this some ways you can see it. But if you got one end or another where the, the surface is flatter, you want that facing out. If it's an irregular side, put it inwards because it's flatter when you put the legs on it, they will stay square. But anyway, here's our, the back end of our three inch piece. Find a little hole. Stick it through. So you got, it's on the line, pull it in. Now turn it around and come back through the other side of the other side. So I don't know if you can see what I got going here. Now it's looped back through. Okay, now you want to line up that the inside edge of the black is right, will be right along the outer back side of the bend. So you want this, this side here to line up the back hook right there. So just adjust your loop, something sort of like that. Get just relatively close to start and then sort of loosely tie down the second side and then readjust it to where you want it. Something sort of like that. So the back edge of here is about even with that. You got that there. So I like to go take a couple of loops I go underneath the loop. It's kind of like locking it in place for three or four wraps under there. Kind of keeps it from moving at all. And then finish wrapping forward. So the same point all the other model is, when I get to the front where it is, I'll come in front of it, a couple wraps to lock it down. And cut the tag end off. See what we got. Then from there, we got to decide what color fly you want to make. Uh, let's go, we've been making purple. We'll go with purple. This is standard size, regular size Estes. I guess they call it standard. It's not the mini, it's not the grande, it's the standard. Get the SS, I got you pre-cut lengths. I think it takes six inches of this, I think. But it's pre-cut in your kits. But if you look at the SS, it kind of has, it's like a Christmas tree that the grain it has, that it's slanting one direction versus the other. Like this one here is slanting to my right versus if I went this way, it's slanting to my left. You want it so that the grain is leaning backwards to the back of the fly. So it should be you know, going like this versus you know, facing forward. And at the point where you had all your mono ends gonna come in, tying the very end of it along the back of the fly, just wrap it down to the bend of the hook, turn it over. Now we're, now we're gonna tie the Estes to the mono loop we made back there. We're gonna move it onto the mono. And 
And as we're, we're wrapping it, we're cinching it down. We want that mono loop to close. Because right now it's kind of open. And when you tie the mono on, you want it to pull it closed. So you keep it underneath. So you go just there. You know, about every four or five wraps I make over it, I'll move one wrap, you know, because I'm wrapping on this side of it. I'm going to put one or two wraps on this side. Because what that does is it locks the, the uh, estes to the mono so that it doesn't want to slide back towards the hook. Because I keep wrapping, 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 it's going to want to keep pushing it back. But if I put that, every now and then put that stopper, it requires less wraps to get it all the way to the back. There, couple there, and right about the back right now. I don't know if you can see that it's basically this like a T. You got the black things coming up and a stem going back. And I'll bring the wrap the mono back to the hook. Get it one wrap onto the hook. So we got the mono, the mono is here at the back of the hook. The estes is all the way against the two pieces of foam. It's all the way against there. I want to wrap the estes forward three wraps. You know, starting right against the foam right there. And what I like to do is I kind of put my finger up there, kind of hold it down. So when I make my second wrap, it slides my fingernails kind of holding down the other piece. So I'm not over wrapping the one I already did. So I got the second one on, finger note right up there. Slide it in. So there's the third one. Now, as you can see, the Estes is right at the back of the hook, right where the mono is. Now just put a couple wraps just to hold the, the Estes to the hook. And this is where you tie in your hackle. It says, I am using name of this stuff. Large crystal hackle, and this one purple, whatever color you like. Uh, I'm making this one a single color all the way for simplicity, but I've made these some two tones, some of them others, because I'm going to put this in. If, if I was making them two tone, I would change my second material wouldn't be a, a crystal hackle, but it would be a polar chenille because the variance that where the crystal hackle is more of a solid color and where the, the uh, polar chenille is more translucent. It has a different sheen to it. So it kind of gives it a different look. It gives it a, actually looks pretty cool. the two colors because it, it kind of adds a little flash without being flash. Not that you couldn't put in, you know, genuine flash shells silver or gold polish chenille if you were making it more of a mineral pattern. But right up front, like I said, uh, when we tie this in, it's the same thing again, the stuff has a slant. You probably see it pretty better on this one, how it definitely leans one direction. You always want the slant tied in going to the back. So this, if I just put my hack all the way, on the very bottom right up where the, the Estes is, I'm just going to start this in and then move the model all the way to the head. So, so now I got the, the hackle in front, the Estes in the back, which I now have to reverse. I want to have the Estes in front. So get him out of the way, put him here. And this is Luria, everybody knows me. I count fibers, I count legs, I count, I count wraps because I tie commercially. Every fly has got to be like every other fly. It can't be one looks, one's heavier, one's lighter, because you add an extra wrap, it swims different or it looks different. So everyone's the same. So this is from back, you had three wraps on that little extension and from the head to, to getting uh, about basically where the mono ends should be 10 wraps. Should be if I should have, so I know if I get one right at the bend, Second one will be right about under the barb, kind of push them up. Third one should be right about at the point. That's how I know if I'm at the right point. 
because you know, five has got to be in the middle. So if three's at the point, I'm doing good. So there's four, there's five, that's pretty good right at the middle, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and there's the end of the mono. That's where I'm gonna come up, 10. And tie it off at that point. You don't need to do a super job because you're gonna go over with nine other things. Tie that in, get the estes out of your way. And this is again, like I said, you gotta want it with the hackle here, you're gonna want the fibers facing the back of the fly. And it's the same dang thing, 10 more wraps. Uh, the last one should, should again be probably just off of the model. First one should be tied up against the hook, should almost be off the estes. I come underneath. Try to get far back as I can. There's one, it should, it's almost the same as before. The second one should be right about under the barb. There's two, three should be right about at the point of the hook. As I come around, I try to make sure I'm not wrapping anything down, push out of the way. Three, four, five, you can see I keep stroking the stuff, the fibers backwards. Six, seven, eight. Ninth one's right off on the end of the estes there. The tenth one will be just off the estes. Number 10. Tie that off. There's a couple of wraps to hold, then I'll stroke everybody back. I'll kind of put a few wraps to keep everybody tied back. And let's go one, two, tie it off, cut my hackle out of there. I'm just gonna put a couple of half hitches here. Hold that in place. Cut the mono. There's the body of the fly. Now to attach the weed guard. Here's where I says it gets another one of these things you probably have never done. Uh, first off, I'm gonna take the, I don't know if this is on camera, can you see the, where my finger is up here? Yep. Okay, the, the two ends of the weed guard, they're not exactly the same, but I wanna cut them to so the same size. This way, I know that my two ends of the weed guards are gonna be the same. Typically, most of you guys would probably tie the weed guard onto the shank right here. Well, we aren't gonna do that. We got a better idea. We're gonna take the weed guard, we're gonna stick it right through feet head. See that the line, see that, that went right through the bead head there. Come the other side. through the bead head. This is why I said, if you pull the two tag ends and you get them even, you know that whatever you pull here, the left and the right should be the same if the tag ends are the same. So it's a good way to even up your weed guards. I like to pull this down till weed guards yeah, about a quarter inch above that between the, the top of the hook here and the weed guard above, I like to have about a quarter of an inch. which would be something sort of like that. So as you can see, we got the two even wheat uh, tag ends over there. And you want to make sure that your wheat goes at one is on the left side. Uh, that shows up. That, that the left the left weed guard is on the left side of the shank and the right weed guard is on the right side of the shank. Because up here, they're going to tend to want to Either both go to one side or the other. Just make sure you got one on one side, one on the other. And cock your hook up about a 45 degree angle like that. Everybody has some good UV glue.
And then the very front hole here, where you put two weak guards, just apply it there. You want that to get in that hole. Get that in there. You got your UV light. Turned it under a little bit. This is just to sort of hold. This isn't even what's going to hold. Because what's going to hold it is now I'm going to turn it over and I'm going to fill the back of the cone head with the UV glue. So what that's doing is going to glue a combination. It locks down the weight. It seals the threads and it holds the weed guards all in one, one motion. Make sure the, the cone head is facing the direction you want it to be. Put the light to it. That's up killing three birds with one stone. And that's in there. And my tag ends and my weed guards, I'll cut them up. I won't cut them off coming in forward. If you come in this way, you, you tend to want to cut some of your hackle off. So always come in from you know, one side or the other. So you can just come down the line and just barely, I'm saying, Show that. I just come down, I really get into that cross. I only have to do you know, that much of a cut. So I know I'm not going to accidentally cut half of my hackle out of there. So basically there is the fly itself. It says, I said, I call the full roll, roll cage weed guard. That's that this thing can roll over anything. Now we have to make the tail. And it says tail, our famous googly balls. What I'm going to do is take two of these suckers. Uh, I don't know if, and like it says, these things come, you know, they come green, they come pink, they come purple, they come blue, they come orange, they come chartreuse. And outside of the chartreuse, I don't use any of these colors because to me, this isn't purple enough. This is, I don't know, some version of purple, mauve, I don't know what. I want purple. So what I do is, if you're really smart with this, you have a pair of rubber gloves. That would be a smart thing. Spike a plastic worm dye. Or a quick coat, either or. These, again, the place, same place they got the hooks, do it mold. They sell it. Uh, Bass Pro Shop sells it. Probably, you know, you just got to make sure you're getting the unscented versions. The other ones smell like garlic. Or you have to watch out that you can see the difference here. This is a worm dye. This one is a lure dye. This is for dyeing metal. This is for dyeing plastic. Not that it won't work. It's just this one... If you dip that thing in here too long, that sucker is going to melt. This, so you don't want this, but it does make it a much more darker color. Say, because it, this one, the worm dye seems to soak in. The lure dye seems to coat. It's what it seems to do. That it actually has a coating on it. But with the worms, you know, get the worm dye. You know, you can get it all sorts of colors. Here's my, here it is. I just typically do, uh, I don't know if this is on screen or not. Just put a napkin off to my side. Probably have purple fingers when I'm done. I'm put this underneath me so we don't cover the entire world. Take uh, four sips or something, grab the worm, dip, dip, out it comes. Grab the worm. Dip, dip, out it comes. It makes a much, much deeper color than if you were just, as I show you, the difference between, and the longer you, it actually gets dark, you can see the difference between what it came to what I made it. 
know, it's a whole different color. This, this is violet is what this color is. This is some sort of purple. But I know as an old plastic worm fisherman, I know violet is a lovely color. We make that. Um, these worms are typically three inches long. If I was making the, the bigger version, the, the one odd size, I would use these full length, the, the three inches. But because we're making a size two version, I want to cut them down to two inches. So I know you can't see that, but I'm just going, you know, on the table, the marker there. And cut. See when I basically just cut off an inch. Uh, there you All right, next, if um, you can't see the table down here. Okay, uh, try to do this off the table. That's gonna be something interesting. I glue these together. What I do is just about a quarter inch of the worm, I'll put a dab of super glue. Take the other one. Press them together. Usually I do this down on the table so I can keep my fingers out of it. Once they kind of hold on to each other a little bit, I can kind of squeeze them together. Okay, so I got, as you can see, the two guys here glued together. This is a step I do, you don't have to, but I find it does help. There's a, in, in the same area, if you went to Home Depot or Ace Hardware, but you're looking for super glue, in the same area you would find the super glue, you would find Loctite brand plastic bonding kit. It's basically a bottle of glue and this marker together. That's all it is. But this marker is a, is a primer. And when you're bonding two different types of plastics together, like this, I just glued the same plastic to the same plastic. But now I want to glue the plastic of the, you know, the foam on the back of that to this, this bonder, this primer here helps that bond. It will, it does make it stronger. It's not that it doesn't work, but um, it does work better. I rarely ever lose a tail being pulled off or cast off. If, you know, if you hit trees behind you, something. if I use the bonder, it usually stays put. If I don't, yeah, every now and then you lose a tail, but nobody thinks you just glue it or not. But the bonder, like I says, uh, I like to just put a little, you know, coat the back of that. Go to the, this, color it up. Grab your super glue. You know, use just what you need. Try to keep it off your fingers. Get that on there. Line it up with this space shuttle landing here. Get it there and squeeze it in and hold it first. Because it's squishy, you have to really push out to get it to hold. If you just touch it, it won't hold. You got to squish it in there. When you do, you got two tails and you got to finish fly. Wow. Well, you time goes commercial. Well, Rainey's just thinking about it. No, you do. Oh, yeah. yeah How yeah. long does it take you to time in here? When I'm doing it, oh, I, I, these actually I can rattle out pretty quick. It may, it may take me 10 minutes, maybe. To me, that's quick. You tie in sections. Yeah, I, I'll make, right. I, I'll tie the, the, the hook with the weed guards and all that on there. Then I'll make the all the legs. And then, you know, when you, when you go for the, you know, the estes in the body and finish it off. Okay. And then I may come back at the end and do the weed guards and all of it. Yeah, you, you do half a dozen at a time and you can get them done real fast. It, it's, but I said one other thing, if you were gonna make like, some of them I've had, you, know, you guys got a, the little ones. If you look at the purple little ones, you got their two-tone, the black head with a purple back half. It's, if you're gonna make them two-tone, 
you do five wraps of each color. Like I said, there's 10 wraps of the Estes, 10 wraps of the hackle. So if I was going two tone, it'd be five wraps of whatever the purple hackle. Then I'd put the five wraps of the purple uh, crystal hackle. Then I'd put five wraps of black Estes, then five wraps of black hackle. So you get, it comes out the, the most even. Or as I says, when I combine, you know, the, the crystal hackle and the polar chenille, I do the same thing. I tie them both in at the same time at the back. When I first put the hackle in, I tie them both in at the same spot. And instead of, it's still 10 wraps, but it's the two of them together. So it's with the two of them side by side, I'll just make five wraps forward versus one going around 10 times. And it says, Somewhere I think in that box there's some brown ones in there or ones with some flash and you'll see the two-toning in them. And there it is, the boxes over there. 